Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It is the 25th of the 10th month on our Creator's calendar, which is the first day of Hanukkah, as we reckon it. And it happens to line up with the 7th of January, 2023, on their Gregorian calendar. But before we get started with our regular reading, I'd like to share a few places in the Maccabees and one in Josephus about the events that went on that led to the observance of what they call Hanukkah, not the perversion of what they do today with the Christmas light or how you call it, but the actual rededication of the Hekel and what it meant for them at that time and what it means for us today. So without further ado, we'll just jump into it. The first reference here is from book two of the Maccabees, which in chronological order, I'm sorry, it might not actually be book two. I think it's actually book three, but they had them switched around. In chronological order, it's the second book of the Maccabees, and this is chapter four, starting on verse 26. It says, now as many of the strangers as had escaped came and told Lysias all which had happened, who, when he heard thereof, was confounded and discouraged, because neither such things as he would were done unto Israel, nor such things as the king commanded him were come to pass. And for reference there, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the king over the northern part of the division of the Grecian Empire, as foretold in Daniel, he was a little horn that grew great and waxed to the east to the south and toward the pleasant land and he was attacking all these people and trying to get it through conquest <clears throat> when he was running out of funds he put his commanders in charge and he took off to go try to plunder the temples that alexander had left in persia to get more money and the things that he had enjoined for his commander to do didn't happen so getting back on track here verse 28 says, the next year, therefore, following, which would be 165 BC, Lysias gathered together three score thousand choice men. And that would be 60,000. And 5,000 horsemen that he might subdue them. So they came into Edomia or Edom and pitched their tents at Beth Shora, and Yahuda met them with ten thousand men. And when he saw that mighty army, he prayed and said, Baruch are you, deliverer of Yisrael, who did quell the violence of the mighty man by the hand of your servant Dawid, and gave the host of the Philistines into the hands of Yahu Nathan, the son of Shaul, and his armor bearer. Now, if you're not familiar, and we'll cover these as we go through scripture, but those are two separate accounts. Yahu Nathan, with his armor bearer, actually attacked the outpost of the Philistines first before the account with Dawid and Goliath. And they went towards the outpost, and he talked to his armor bearer, whose armor bearer was all for doing whatever he wanted. And he said, he put his trust in Yahuwah, and he said, if... The Philistines say, come up here, then Yahoo has given them into our hands. But if they try to say, hey, we're going to go out to you, then we're going to take off because it's not going to happen. And when they went, they said, come up here. And he, in belief, believing that Yahuwah had so ordained it, went up there and he attacked and overcame the outpost. And they had a great deliverance at his hand. The second account was when the armies of the Philistines were gathered together on one mountain and the armies of Yisrael was gathered on another mountain. And you had Goliath coming out for almost, I believe, it was a month of days, reviling them and trying to call out one man to fight against him. And then whoever lost that other army would be in servitude to them or that other people. And the people were coward or they were fearful because of his size and they were taking those rebukes for quite a while and when Dawid 
was sent to the camp to provide food and things for his brothers that were joined in the army and the king he overheard the the giant the uncircumcised philistine reviling our maker and didn't stand for it he was just a boy but he took him on and overcame him through the power of yahuwah and for no means of himself but trusting in the word so they had great deliverances through them <clears throat> but continuing this is his prayer he says shut up this army in the hand of your people Yisrael, and let them be confounded in their power and their horsemen give to them cowardice and melt away their boldness of their strength and let them be overwhelmed in their destruction cast them down with the sword of them which love you and let all those who know your name praise you in hymns so they joined the battle and there were slain of the host of Lysias about 5,000 men. Even before them were they slain. Now when Lysias saw his army put to flight, and the manliness of Yahuda's soldiers, and how they were ready either to live or die valiantly, he went to Antioch and gathered together a company of strangers. And having made his army greater than it was, he purposed to come again into Yahuda. Then said Yahuda and his brethren, Behold, our enemies are discomforted. Let us go up to cleanse and dedicate the sanctuary. Upon this, all the host assembled themselves together and went up into Mount Zion. And they saw the set-apart place desolate and the altar profane, and the gates burnt down, and shrubs growing in the courts as in a forest, for or, or in one of the mountains. Yea, and the Kohanim's chambers pulled down, and they rent their clothes, and made great lamentation, and cast ashes upon their heads and fell down flat to the ground upon their faces, and blew an alarm with the trumpets, and cried towards Shamayim. Then Yahuda appointed certain men to fight against those who were in the fortress, until he had cleansed the set-apart place. Now, the fortress was built to help guard against anyone doing things in the temple, or the Hekel, and the Kohanim would be attacked from it whenever they were doing their offerings. Just for context there. So he chose Kohanim of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the Torah, and they cleanse the set-apart place and bear out the defiled stones into an unclean place. And as they consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profane, a good counsel came into their minds to pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them, because the heathen had defiled it. Wherefore, they pulled it down, and laid up the stones in the mountain of the house in a convenient place, until there should come a foreteller to show what should be done with them. Then they took whole stones according to the Torah and built a new altar according to the former and built up the set-apart place and the inner parts of the house and hollowed the courts and made also new set-apart vessels and into the temple they brought the candlestick and the altar of incense and the table. And upon them, sorry, and upon the altar they burnt incense, and the lamps which were upon the candlestick they lighted, and they gave light to the Hekel. Furthermore, they set the loaves upon the table, and spread out the veils, and finished all the works which they had begun to make. Now on the five and twentieth day of the ninth month, it says ninth month here, but um 
if you watch the AC for dummies, the anti mishiach for dummies videos, and if you look into this more, it's quite it's quite plain that it was the December twenty fifth. It was what they do for Christmas, the same day that that happened, which is the actual tenth month, not the ninth. And in the other versions, there you find it's in the Macedonian. It, they, I believe it's Josephus mentions what month it is as well, but you can still look these things up. However. This is just more evidence that sometimes these words are these works are tampered with, which does happen, unfortunately. It says, which is called the month of Kislu, in the hundred and forty and eighth year, they rose up betimes in the morning and offered sacrifice according to the Torah upon the new altar of burnt offerings which they had made. At what time? And what day the heathen had profaned it, even in that was it dedicated with songs, with cisterns, or citherns, and lyres and cymbals. Then all the people fell upon their faces, worshipping and praising the El of the Shamayim, who had given them good success. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness, and sacrificed the sacrifice of deliverance and praise. So he said, please give us this delivery so that those who love you can sing hymns to you and praise you, right? Then he gave them the delivery, and now they're singing hymns and praising him, accomplishing the thing that they said they would do. They decked also the forefront of the Hekel with crowns of gold and with small shields, and the gates and the chambers they renewed and hanged doors upon them. Thus was there very great gladness among the people, for that the reproach of the heathen was put away. Moreover, Yahuda and his brethren, with the whole congregation of Yisrael, ordained that the days of the dedication of the altar should be kept in the season from year to year by the space of eight days, from the twenty and fifth day of the month of Kislu, with mirth and gladness. All right, and if you give me just one moment, we will... All right, so what we just read was actually from book... I believe Sister Cindy had said it was book one in the normal accounting of them, but in the version of the five books of the Maccabees I had, we have in a PDF, it's book two because it takes place in chronological order second. This one that we're reading now is titled as book three, but they have it as book two in, in normal reckoning. And this is from chapter 10 at the beginning of it. It says, now Maccabee and his company, Yahuwah guiding them, recovered the Hekel and the city. But the altars which the heathen had built in the open street, and also the chapels, they pulled down. And having cleansed the Hekel, they made another altar. And striking stones, they took fire out of them, and offered an offering after three years, and set forth incense and lights and showbread. When that was done, they fell flat down, and besought Yahuwah that they might come no more into such troubles. Now, just real quick, it says two years in this text, but there's a footnote in it that talks about how it's actually three years, and that's what it should be written. It's also what's accounted in Josephus, and... Um, one of the Greek manuscripts has it written correctly, but this is just more evidence that things were tampered with. And remember, any type of error is always attributed to Satan to promote confusion. But we don't have to be confused if we do things according to Scripture. You look for two or more witnesses to establish every matter. Back on track here, it says, But if they sinned any more against him, Right, and they, they besought Yahuwah that they might come no more into such troubles. This is an important part, because what they're asking for and what happened to them 
is exactly what he gave them or he gave them that they would he would not send any more any more enemies but he would himself would come or he himself would correct them so after 160 so years after they apostatize again and they turn away he came himself to correct them just like they were asking here so pay attention it's very important and when that was done they fell flat down and besought Yahuwah that they might come no more into such troubles. But if they sinned any more against him, that he himself would chasten them with mercy, and that they might not be delivered unto the blasphemous and barbarous nations. Now upon the same day that the Hekel had been profaned by strangers, it happened that on the same day, the purification of it took place. Even the fifth and twentieth day of the same month, which is Keslu. And they kept eight days with gladness, as in the feast of the tabernacles, remembering that not long before they had holden the feast of the tabernacles when they wandered in the mountains and dens like wild beasts. Therefore they bear branches, and fair burrows, and palms also, and sing psalms unto him who had given them good success in cleansing his place. They ordained also by a common statute and decree, that every year those days should be kept by the whole nation of the Yahudim. And this was the end of Antiochus called Epiphanes. All right, so thank you for that. And then just one moment, we're going to get to the account in Josephus. This last section that we're going to share about these same events is from the, the complete works of Josephus, specifically the Antiquities of the Yahudim, Book 12, Chapter 7, Section 6 and 7. So starting with Section 6, it says, when, therefore, the generals of Antiochus' armies had been beaten so often, Yahuda assembled the people together and told them that after these many victories which Elohim had given them, they ought to go up to Yerushalayim and purify the Hekel and offer the appointed sacrifices. But as soon as he, with the whole multitude, was come to Yerushalayim, and found the temple, or Hekel, deserted, and its gates burnt down, and plants growing in the Hekel of their own accord, <clears throat> excuse me, on account of its desertion. He and those that were with him began to lament, and were quite confounded at the sight of the Hekel. So he chose out some of his soldiers and gave them order to fight against those guards that were in the citadel until he should have purified the Hekel. When, therefore, he had carefully purged it and had brought in new vessels, the candlestick, the table, and the altar, which were made of gold, he hung up the veils at the gates and added doors to them. He also took down the altar and built a new one of stones that he gathered together and not of such as were hewn with iron tools. If you remember, the instructions for making an altar unto him was to make an altar of unhewn stone that was not, was not chiseled with the, man of, the hand of a man or an artisan, because then you would have profaned it. And that was the same from the beginning, where they just build an altar of unhewn rocks, then pile it together. You can see evidence of it. On Mount Ararat, I believe, where Noah had first offered when he came out of the ark. You can still see that altar that was built at Mount Sinai in Arabia. At least you could by the when Ron Wyatt was doing his documentaries and the people that followed after him, they recorded it. And you can see the, the ramp leading up and the altar that was built of unhewn stones. And the same was being done here. So on the five and twentieth day of Kislu, which the Macedonians call Apellines, 
A P E L I E N S, Apollines. They lighted the lamps that were on the candlestick or menorah and offered incense upon the altar and laid the loaves upon the table and offered burnt offerings upon the new altar. Now it so fell out that these things were done on the very same day on which their elbreathed worship had fallen off and was reduced to a profane and common use after three years' time, for so it was that the Hekel was made desolate by Antiochus, and so continued for three years. This desolation, or the, the 2300 Yamim, right? The 2300, it, it says mornings and evenings in the Hebrew, but that which is offered continually was taken away, right? And it says, uh, sorry about that. But it was dedicated anew on the same day, on the 25th of the month of Apollines, on the 148th year, and on the 154th Olympiad. So the 148th year was the 148th year of the Grecian Empire, since, since Alexander the Great took over the empire and beat the Persians. And then the 154th Olympiad was according to how they reckoned time in Greece and Rome before then. Which, you can't quote me here, but I believe an Olympiad is four years. So every Olympiad would be a four-year period. <clears throat> and this desolation came to pass according to the foretelling of Daniel, which was given 408 years before. For he declared that the Macedonians would dissolve that worship for some time. Now Yahuda celebrated the festival of the restoration of the sacrifices of the temple for eight days, and omitted no sort of pleasures thereon, but he feasted upon them very rich and splendid sacrifices, and he honored Elohim, and delighted them by hymns and psalms. Nay, they were so very glad at the revival of their customs, when, after a long time of intermission, they unexpectedly had regained the freedom or liberty of their worship, that they made it a law for their posterity, that they should keep a festival on account of the restoration of their hikel or temple worship for eight days. And from that time to this, we celebrate this festival and call it lights. I suppose the reason was because this liberty beyond our hopes or expectations appeared to us, and that thence was the name given to that festival. Yahuda also rebuilt the walls around about the city and reared towers of great height against the incursions of enemies and set guards therein. He also fortified the city of Beth Shura, or Beth Sora, sorry that it might serve as a citadel against any distresses that might come from our enemies. All right, and then, ob willing, you can see the there's nothing pagan or wrong about what they were doing. They could not have had deliverance if it wasn't given from our maker. And they were celebrating just like Noak celebrated the four Chodeshim he first instituted, instituted that was carried down to posterity. And Abraham first kept the feast, as we'll see in Yobelim. But these things were established to rejoice and to thank our maker for what he's doing with his creation and the works of his hands. So just one more moment. We're going to go ahead and check out Daniel so you can see what it's all about. The foretelling that was given 408 years beforehand that talked about these very events. So please bear with me and we will be right back. All right, so we're going to go ahead and read about the events that were foretold with the Maccabees here. And for anyone that's interested, that is in Daniel chapter 8. It specifically starts about verse 5, what we're concerned with, but we're going to start at the beginning just for context and continuity. It says, In the third year of the kingdom of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, 
after the one that appeared to me the first time. And I looked while I was looking, or sorry, and it came to be, or sorry, I messed up. And I looked in the vision and it came to be while I was looking that I was in the citadel of Shushan, which is in the province of Elam, what we call Persia today. And I looked in the vision and I was by the river Yulai. And I lifted my eyes and looked and saw a ram standing beside the river. And it had two horns, and the two horns were high. And one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. That would be the Medio Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, which the uh, Medes were ruling first, but the Persians were the greater of the two. And that ties all the way back to Madai who was a son of Yefeth, he was allotted what we call Spain or Tarshish back in the day, but Spain, and he, he did not want to stay in the Isles of the Seas there. He didn't like it, so he petitioned his father-in-law for an allotment or an inheritance among him, and he was brought over to where the Shemites were in uh, by Elam, which we call Persia today, and that's where the Medo-Persian Empire had its foundings. This is, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast could stand before him and there was no one to deliver from his hand while he did as he pleased and became great. And I was observing and saw a male goat. Came from the west over the surface of all the earth without touching the ground and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes this would be the grecian empire and there's more involved with this We're, we don't want to get into all the details but the one horn represents alexander the great these things are explained elsewhere it says verse six it says and he came to the ram that had two horns which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him in the rage of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he became embittered against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he threw him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one to deliver the ram from his hand. And the male goat became very great. That's reminiscent of Alexander, given the title of the great, right? But when he was strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four conspicuous ones came up to the four winds of Shamayim. And from one of them, sorry, so the four horns after Alexander fell, his empire was split into four. This is known history, All right? And from one of them came a little horn, which became exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the splendid land, which would be the west there or what we call Palestine today, the land of Yisrael or Yahuda at the time. And this is the rise of Antiochus Epiphanes, which we were just talking about. And it became great up to the host of the Shamayim, and it caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and trampled them down. It even exalted itself as high as the prince of the host, and it took that which is continual away from him and threw down the foundation of his set-apart place. That was taking away the daily offerings, the morning and evening sacrifices, and defiling the Hekel, which we just covered the rededication of. And because of transgression, an army was given over to oppose that which is continual, and it threw the truth down to the ground, and it acted and prospered. And then I heard a certain set-apart one speaking, and another set-apart one said to that certain one who was speaking, now, that where it's translated right there is very peculiar, but it says that certain set-apart one, 
in reality, that word is palmoni. And they have books written about this, but palmoni means the wonderful numberer. It mentions in the Psalms, teach us to number our days so that we might come into the fear of you. And like I said, there's books written about Palmoni and how he accurately numbers and, and everything is by order and it's all aligned. Very, very interesting things, but they don't ever translate that in any version of scripture that I know of correctly. They call it a certain set of part one instead of the wonderful numberer. In the apostolic constitutions, I believe it's in the prayer of what you should be thinking on and meditating on on the Sabbath. It actually mentions Palmoni, the wonderful number. And I didn't know what that was when I first came across it. And I had to, to look into it and found out this is the reference to it. So now you know, too, it's Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. But he says to that wonderful number, tell when is the vision concerning that which is continual and the transgression that lays waste to make both the set-apart place and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, for 2,300 nights, but that it's literally evening, morning, evening and mornings. So and it's the evening and morning offerings, 2,300 of them, which if you do the math is three years. Then that which is set apart shall be made right. And right there, is a foretelling of the rededication of the Hikel. Now, we'll go ahead and read a little bit more so you can see the context there and that this was talking about the Grecian Empire, so there's no doubts in anyone's mind. It says, And it came to be when I, Daniel, had seen the vision that I sought comprehension and see before me stood one having the appearance of a mighty man. And I heard a man's voice between the Yulai who called and said, Gabriel, which means mighty man of El, make this man comprehend the vision. He then came near where I stood. And when he came, I feared and fell on my face. But he said to me, comprehend, son of man, for the vision is for the time of the end. And as he was speaking with me, now, for the time of the end, when our Mashiach came, he said these were the beginnings of the end times, right? The times of the end were in process 2,000 years ago. And that makes context, or it makes sense only in the context of the creation week, where you have the fourth, fifth, and sixth days before the millennial reign, the, the Shabbat. Those are the end times of the week for his purposes. Verse 18, it says, And as he was speaking with me, I fell stunned upon my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up straight and said, Look, I am making known to you what shall take place in the latter time of the wrath, for at the appointed time shall be the end. The ram which you saw, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the king of Greece. And the large horn between its eyes is the first king. And that it was broken and four stood up in its place are four rulerships arising out of that nation, but not in its power. And in the latter time of their rule, when the transgressions have filled up their measure, a king fierce of face and skilled at intrigues shall stand up and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power and he shall destroy incredibly and shall prosper and thrive and destroy mighty men and the set apart people and through his skill he shall make deceit prosper in his hand and hold himself to be great in his heart and destroy many who are at ease, and even stand against the prince of princes. Yet without a hand he shall be broken. And I don't know if you're familiar, but 
just for context, the whole reason why it's called the Maccabees and the things that and the word we have in English is macabre, which they have in theater. It's about dark, gory things has to do with book two and book four in the accounts of the elderly Cohen, the seven sons from a child to a man and the, the mother of them who were all grievously tortured and put to death for not eating swine's flesh from what was sacrificed on the Hekel when Antiochus came in, he set up a statue of Zeus on the December 25th, and he slaughtered a pig on the altar. And then he went around and made the people defile themselves by partaking of it. And anyone who wouldn't, he made an example of by grievously torturing. They were all martyrs for the truth. And they proclaimed that what he was doing was going to come back on him. After he had done those events, he started to have sickness. His bowels were hurting and he went through suffering for quite a long time. He started, it got so bad that he couldn't be around anyone. He stank so much and he was alone away from everyone when he died without a man's hand touching him. So it was literally fulfilled in him. And he was a type and picture of the little horn that was to come that would profane or abominate and desolate the temple not made with hands by the observance of the christ mass on december 25th which was actually done by sixtus the third the 44th bishop of rome and the little horn that was foretold that was coming from the roman empire verse 26 it says and what was said in the vision of the evening and morning is truth and hide the vision, for it is after many days. And I, Daniel, was stricken and became sick for days. Then I rose up and went about the king's work, and I was amazed at the vision, but there was no comprehension. So he was saying even after he had received that, he didn't quite comprehend it, which is a true condition for all foretelling before it actually is fulfilled, especially when it's close at hand. And it has to do with events that we're living through. That's why uh, throughout history, if you read the divine program of the world's history, if you read some of the things that they knew, and there's two books written with that very title, one by Henry Grattan Guinness, who also wrote a book called Light at the End Days, or I, I might be misquoting, but he actually foretold the exact dates of when the Turkish power would be overcome, the powers of the anti mashiach would be overcome in 1917, and the uh, the return of the Yahudim to the land in the 1940s. 1943, I believe, he put the exact years that those would happen. And he died seven years before the uh, end of World War I when the Battle of Har Megiddo, or what they call Armageddon, was actually fulfilled. So there's a lot of things we get confused because of counter-reformation doctrines but these are events that were known just not distinctly by people but like i was saying they knew that they were going to be ephraim and manashe the sons of yahusuf america and britain if you will would be used and help with allied believers to take down the papal the the martial papal powers in the land and liberate it for the yahudim's return they knew that that was going to happen they were working towards that goal as literal fulfillment of foretelling and this was the same time when the fullness or the meloha goyim was happening the fullness of the nations was coming in with the colonization of the desolate desolate places of the world from the british empire and the other sons of yahusuf as promised in fulfillment of the birthright that was given to them and that was when the veil was being lifted and they started realizing that they were of the 12 tribes specifically britain being a representative of Ephraim and America of Manashe. They're not the only ones that live in these places, but that is the, that's the general, anyone that sojourns with them is called by that name. Just like anyone that was of Asher or Naphtali or whoever that was still in the land was called a Yahudi. Just like the Benjamite, Benjamin that was there was called Yahudim. You're called by the name of the one you sojourn with. But um, that's for another time. However, thank you for letting me share that. And we're going to go ahead and get back on with what we were doing. Just one moment.
All right. Shalom again, everyone. Sorry about uh, the incontinuity of what we're sharing today, but I thought it would be very important since it is the first day of Hanukkah as we reckon it, that we cover just what that represented, both the actual fulfillment of the rededication as it's recorded in the different writings, which we had three witnesses, the two witnesses from the Maccabees and one from well, Josephus or Yahusuf in his Antiquities of the Yahudim, and then the actual foretelling of the very account or the thing that would happen and the foretelling of the rededication that is in the book of Daniel chapter 8. So with that being said and done, we'll go ahead and get back on what we were reading, which is in the book of Hanok, and we're on chapter 14. If you remember, I believe starting at chapter 10 and going on to chapter 16 is the account of what happened with the giants, the, the watchers that came down, changed their form, mated after, lusted with women, mated with them, brought in astrology, witchcraft, sorcery, makeup, weapons, and all these different things that caused problems, including the, the use of metals and also monetary systems, and uh, caused divisions and disparity, inequality amongst men. Every one of these things of, uh, that, that are going to be done away with when our Mashiach comes. But we're still finishing that up, and we're on chapter 14. So it says, the book of the words of righteousness and the reprimand of the eternal watchers in accordance with the command of Yahuwah, the Kodesh Great One, in that vision. I saw in my sleep what I now say with the tongue of flesh and with the breath of my mouth, which Yahuwah, the Great One, has given to men to converse with and to comprehend with the heart. As he has created and given to man the power of comprehending the word of chokmah, or wisdom, so has he created me also, and given me the power of reprimanding the watchers, the children of the Shemaim. I wrote down your petition, and in my vision it appeared thus. Sorry about that. And in my vision, it appeared thus, that your petition will not be granted unto you throughout all the days of eternity. And judgment has been finally passed upon you. Even so, will not be granted unto you. And again, I'd like to recall to your mind, as you do, so it will be done unto you. The watchers and their children showed no remorse, listened to no petition for anyone who asked them for leniency, for mercy. They went ahead and took and plundered men of their goods and then ate them themselves and did horrible things to one another. And so as they did, showing no mercy, they had received none. And from here on, you shall not ascend into the Shemaim unto all eternity. And in bonds of the land, the decree has gone forth to bind you for all the days of the world. If you recall, Yahushua said that no, no one has gone up nor come down out of the Shemaim except the son of Adam. And you can see accounts throughout the original covenant where the messenger of Yahuwah ascended or descended of his own volition. He went up in the offerings and he came down and men witness it. But the messengers never go up and down or ascend and descend of their own volition. It's only by permission of the one above that these things happen. And also Hanok, he did not ascend of his own volition, but he was brought up in a vision changed into like the messengers by the will of our maker. In the actual Greek text, when it says that he ascended, it, the word is used of, the, of his own power, that it's happening. But when others are brought up, it's not of their power. It says, and in bonds of the land, or sorry, I read that part. <clears throat> Verse 6, and previously you shall have seen the destruction of your beloved son, and you shall have no pleasure in them. That should be sons, I'm sorry. 
but they shall fall before you by the sword. And your petitions on their behalf shall not be granted, nor yet on your own, even if you weep and pray and speak all the words contained in the writing which I have written. And the vision was shown unto me thus, See, in the vision, clouds invited me, and a mist summoned me. And the course of the stars and the lightnings sped and hastened me, and the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward, and carried me into the Shemaim. says, and the vision was shown to me thus. See, and I'm sorry, I'm just repeating myself, but we, we took a break for a moment. In the vision, clouds invited me, and a mist summoned me, and the course of the stars and the lightning sped and hastened me. And the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward, and carried me into the Shamayim. And I went till I drew near to a wall which was built of crystals and surrounded by tongues of fire, and it began to frighten me. And I went into the tongues of fire and drew near to a large house which was built of crystals, and the walls of the house were like a mosaic of crystals, and its groundwork was of crystal. Its ceiling was like the path of the stars and lightning. And between them were fiery, fiery cherubim, and their shamayim was as water. Now, I want to mention something. If you watched the Founded Earth Brothers video on the firmament and the things that were being done there, there was someone who was in the military working on as a crew chief, I believe, on helicopters that got stationed in Antarctica for a while. And he got to talk to some of the scientists about the sky ice that they used to work on that they never shared with anybody. And he actually got to hold some and watch it evaporate and shrink in his hand. It looked like sapphire stone and it was colder than the ice around it. That's why they couldn't take it elsewhere to study it because it was too warm anywhere else in the world. But it was like crystal ice-like crystal, which is also mentioned in Yehezkiel, I believe it might be in Amos, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in the Recognitions of Clement, that it's ice-like crystal, which is what the firmament is made out of. Right here, you can see that as well. And he also will mention in just a moment that it was cold and hot because of the, the firmament that he was right there with, and then the fires that they're going for, uh, the tongues of fire that they're going through and near. But um, above the firmament is the waters that were being held off of us. And that is the, the part of the first Shamayim that he's talking about. Their sky was like water. In the Testament of Louis, you also have the, uh, when he's brought up into the Shamayim, he's looking down from the Shamayim above the firmament. And he sees the waters that are above it. That is their, their oceans, if you will for that level of the uh, the Shamayim, or the heavens, if you will. All right, so to continue, verse 12, and it says, <clears throat> And flaming fire surrounded the walls, and its portals blazed with fire. And I entered into that house, and it was hot as fire and cold as ice. There were no delights of life within. Fear covered me, and trembling took hold of me. And, I, or, and as I quaked and trembled, I fell upon my face. And I saw a vision, and see, there was a second house greater than the former, and the entire portal stood open before me and it was built of flames of fire. Now, in other places, in the ascension of Yeshiyahu and in Irenaeus, I believe in his, um, it might be in the demonstrations of the apostolic preaching, but I believe it's in his five books against heresies. He, they both mention 
seven firmaments and the different layers of it. You can also see this when you're reading the songs of the Sabbath sacrifices and the Thanksgiving hymns in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they talk about the multiple Shemaim, plural, also in the Testament of Louis, sorry, but the multiple seven Shemaim and the different layers of the Shemaim that you have. This one does not describe it as seven of them, but he does describe you have the one here and there's no delights of life. There's nothing like what you see in the land. And then above it is even more spectacular. And as you go, they, they become greater and different. You can see that again when you read specifically the songs of the Sabbath sacrifices and some of the Thanksgiving hymns from the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're in fragments, but you can see these things as well. All right, so verse 16. And it says, and in every respect, it so excelled in splendor and magnificence and extent that I cannot describe to you its splendor and extent. And its floor was of fire, and above it were lightnings and the paths of the stars, and its ceiling also was flaming fire. And I looked and saw therein a high throne, its appearance as crystal, and the wheels thereof as the shining sun. And there was the vision of the cherubim. And from underneath the throne came streams of flaming fire, so that I could not look upon it. And the great esteem sat upon it, and his garment shone more brightly than the sun and were whiter than any snow. This would be a representation in the Ruach of what the Father is perceived as. His garments are, are brighter than the sun. When you see what they call the transfiguration of our Mashiach in the Good News accounts, his face shines as the sun. But here the Father's garments are brighter than that. And this is again another one of the reasons why our Mashiach said the Father is greater than I. <clears throat> None of the messengers was able to come in and see the face of the magnificence and esteem, and no flesh could look upon him. Again, this is the Father that's being spoken of, because no one can see him, no flesh, no man can see him and live, and not even the messengers, but the, the Son only is the one who can speak and, and gaze upon him. This is why it mentions that he dwells in unapproachable light and he's inaccessible to others but we know him through his mashiach through the word or the messenger of his presence if you will the flaming fire was round about him and a great fire stood before him and none around could draw near him ten thousand times ten thousand before him yet he needed no counselor and the most kodashim or set apart ones who were near to him, did not leave by night, nor depart from him. And until then I had been prostrate, on my face trembling. And Yahuwah called me with his own mouth, and said to me, Come here, Hanok, and hear my word. And one of the Kodeshim came to me and woke me, sorry, and woke and made it should be made me approach the door, and I bowed my face downwards. Chapter 15. And he answered and said to me, and I heard his voice, Fear not, Hanok, you righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach here and hear my voice. And go, say to the watchers of the Shemaim, who have sent you to intercede for them, you should intercede for men and not men for you. And there's actually, I believe it's mentioned in the Testament of Louis, there is in the highest Shemaim, off, one of them is just messengers that are meant for interceding for men in the world. And you, sorry, 
And have you left the high Kodesh and eternal Shamayim and lain with women, and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, and taken to yourselves wives, and done like the children of the land, and begotten giants as sons? And though you were Kodesh, Ruachni, or spiritual, living the eternal life, you have defiled yourselves with women, and have brought forth with the blood of flesh. And as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood, as those also do who die and perish. This is the only other place in anywhere in scripture where you're going to find the reference to the answer that our Mashiach gave to the Saudis when they came and asked him the parable about the woman who had seven brothers, his husband, and they all died without having children. And they said, at the resurrection, whose, whose wife shall she be? And he rebuked them for not knowing the scriptures nor the power of Elohim. And then he explained that in the resurrection, you'll be made like messengers, which are immortal. And you're not supposed to be propagating and having a wife and having children like that. It's not going to be the same. But it says, therefore, have I given them wives also that they might impregnate them and bring forth children by them that thus none might be lacking to them on the land. But you were formerly ruachni, or spiritual, living the eternal life, and immortal for all generations of the world. And therefore I have not appointed wives for you. For as for the spiritual one of the Shemaim, in the Shemaim is their dwelling. And now the giants who are produced from the Ruachoth, or spirits of and flesh, shall be called evil spirits on the land, and on the land shall be their dwelling. This is what we call demons. This is very important because this is where they're given their jurisdiction, what they're going to be doing, and why things are the way they are, right? Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies because they are born from men and from the Kodesh watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They shall be evil spirits on the land, and evil spirits they shall be called. As for the spirits of the Shemaim, in the Shemaim shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits or ruachoth of the land, which are born upon the land, on the land shall be their dwelling. Another witness for this is in Ecclesiastes, where he says the, the spirit of a man goes, or the ruach of a man goes upward, but the spirit of a beast or animal goes down into the land. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle and work destruction on the land and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger and thirst and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women because they have proceeded from them. Chapter 16. From the days of the slaughter and destruction and death of the giants, from the inner being of whose flesh the spirits, having gone forth, shall destroy without incurring judgment, thus shall they destroy until the day of the complete end, the great judgment, in which the age shall be ended, over the watchers and the wicked, even so shall be completely ended. And this is why demons aren't judged for what they're doing right now. But if you recall, when our Mashiach was walking in the land there, and some of the demons would encounter him, they said, have you come to destroy me before the time? Speaking of this very thing, because it was decreed that they would be without judgment or incurring punishment until the consummation. It says, and now as to the watchers, who have sent to or who have sent you to intercede for them 
who had been previously in the Shamayim, say to them, You have been in the Shamayim, but all the mysteries had not yet been revealed to you, and you knew worthless matters, and these in the hardness of your hearts you have made known to the women. And through these mysteries, women and men work much evil on the land. Say, say to them, therefore, you shall have no shalom. Now, again, we covered last week and the week beforehand the things that happened. Or the things that they brought to men, astrology, both the witchcraft of painting the eyes, makeup, tinctures, um, the precious metals for jewelry and for monetary uses, metals used for swords and armor and fighting, um, incantations, witchcraft, sorcery, or magic, sorcery, and other things that they brought upon men which are all used to cause problems and cause much evil even to today and it's still going on but we'll we'll cover that more in a little bit <clears throat> all right chapter 17 it says and they took and brought me to a place in which those were there were like flaming or those were there were like flaming fire and when they wanted they appeared as men and they brought me to the place of darkness and to a mountain the point of whose summit reached the shamayim this might be mount meru in the center of the world it might be some other place it's not very distinct here and I saw the places of the lights and the treasuries of the stars and of the thunder and in the uttermost depths where there were a fiery bow and arrows and their quiver and a fiery sword and all the lightnings. And they took me to the living waters and to the fire of the west, which receives every going down of the sun. And I came to a river of fire in which the fire flows like water and discharges itself into the great sea into the west. Now, these might sound like weird things, but this is magma flowing like you see in Hawaii or the, where the islands are formed out in the Pacific. All right. I saw the great rivers and came to the great river and to the great darkness and went to the place where no flesh walks. I saw the mountains of the darkness of winter, and the place where all the waters of the deep flow. I saw the mouths of all the rivers of the land and the mouth of the deep. There's an account, I can't remember the name of it, I'll have to look, but the gentleman who wrote it was named Olaf, and he went to the north center, if you will. There's also a gentleman, John D., was writing letters with Mercator, who wrote, uh, it drew the map of the, the center of the earth, or the north, where you had the four islands surrounded by a ring of mountains. And in the middle of that was, you had four flowing, inflowing rivers. And the waters in the middle would actually go down into a chasm, or there was a huge um whirlpool i think it was f I, the magnetic mountain in the center of the earth is 33 miles circumference and there was like a 480 mile or something whirlpool where all the waters would go down and then they would go through under the earth and recycle out the south by antarctica and that's the giant water you know, the, the place of the waters and where they go i, I can't remember the name of the book but it was an account from a man named Olaf who, as a boy, as a fisherman, went with his father and they decided to go to the north. And they went down there. Their ship was was wrecked, but they were found by giants, men that were about 12 to 15 feet tall. 
and they had electricity they had motorized boats there were sailing vessels and they took them to the island called yahoo and there was also a place named eden down there but they learn their language, talk with them for a few years, and then they were allowed to leave by going to the south and coming out. They could not go out the way they came. His father had passed away in their return or trying or trying to get back, and he was eventually rescued. But when he tried to let his story become known, they institutionalized him for a while, and then he never mentioned it again until he was retired and old, and he wrote about it. So... He's not the only one that made an account of things there. There was also, like I said, Mercator, who drew the map of the area. He had had, and John D were writing about someone who a few hundred years before had at the instigation and using magic and demons had went and traveled there and wrote about it. He called it the uh, something Fortunata was the name of that writing. I'll have to look these up. I'm sorry. But um he recorded what it was like there. King Arthur was also recorded to have traveled and brought men there, and they couldn't return because the inflowing rivers flew, were flowing too much or too fast. One of the islands had pygmies in them, one of the four that were surrounded by those mountains. And um, it's a very interesting record of the things that are going on in the North Center. You used to have these maps that would show it, but after, I believe... A concerted effort after the 1600s they wiped it off of every map it's not talked about anywhere greenland used to actually connect with that but after a while the ring or the circle of mountains that were in that south part of the section that touched greenland kind of sank and they're underwater if i yeah it, when i find out about those i'll put it in the description here and also i'll mention it to you I can't say that everything in them is completely accurate, but these are multiple different witnesses from a variety of sources that talk about this stuff. And if you look at how the water courses are described in Ecclesiastes, it kind of follows that same thing. All right, so we're at the top of 18, and it's about that time, so we're going to go ahead and sign off for today and say that, ob willing, everything in here is edifying. There's a lot of there's a lot of information that might be over the heads of quite a few people. The idea of the center of the world being the north and there being a place under it with giants, and that, that kind of sounds crazy, but these things are actually true events of things that were written. The story with Olaf happened in the 1800s. It was, I believe, 30 or so years before electricity was brought up and, and made popular in the world. He had seen it down there, and it was pretty amazing stuff that he talks about. But it's collaborated by other sources. Hey, brother. Uh, I was going to say, um, on the YouTube channel, uh, Flat Water, Flat Earth, yes. they have that a whole section of different people's writings and i believe they have their writing olaf's writing um but i mean hours i mean hundreds of hours of the center of the earth type thing with like mount meru and all these these rivers and, and the, i mean there's just hours so if anybody's interested you can really learn a lot from that stuff absolutely and that's flat water flat earth um th that's the name of the youtube channel he was the yeah. gentleman the the one that made that was actually where I got that information from originally. And I looked up the letters, I got the PDFs for them with John D, the excursions of, of Arthur going to the North. And I believe it was eight years later, the children of those first explorers came back to talk to the, the king that was there and tell them about things that were going on. So um, that's where I got that information from too. But he has like, like brother Chris was just mentioning, hundreds of hours worth of information on those including the whole story of olaf i believe he has the uh he has the fortunatus book and the writings of what they were seeing there about the magnetic mountain and what they say about it when you had a ship that was anywhere close to it it just get pulled right to the thing and stick to it because of the iron nails and the metal that was used in building it so it was a one-way trip for anyone that was going that going around there they usually got stuck and could never return a lot of 
I believe it's in Hanok here, that in the north center is also the place of paradise. And that could be, this could be where Eden is, might have been the original Garden of Eden. And then to the east of Eden would have been <clears throat> the land of Shem, which was what was allotted to Shem in the place where a paradise was also part of that allotment. So there's a lot of things to think about there, but Father willing, what we've covered will be edifying and everyone can appreciate at least the accounts of the, the dedication, how that was foretold by Daniel, and then the finishing of the uh, reprimand of the watchers here for what was happening. This, along with what's in Yobelim, starting with chapter 10, but it's in a few different places, and then fully explained in the recognitions of Clement and with the good news accounts, you can see what demons are, how they came about, what they're allowed to do, and the power men have over them through obedience to the truth and being pious. And all of that was foreordained. Everything that's going to happen is because of what's going on with these minions of Satan, and anyone who's going along with them will be consigned to the ageless fires when they're judged as well, which is also explained in the recognitions in other places. So, I'm willing you all enjoyed this, and we'll see you next week. You have a wonderful Shabbat and a great week ahead. Shavuot Tov. Shalom.